minutes. Yeah, that's Oh, okay. I really just didn't want to have to slip out of my How are you? What, what is the shaking hands thing? Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah, no, I shouldn't have to. I shouldn't have to. But now I probably Oh, how are you? Uh, 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 Seriously, so you uh, 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 Nobody wanted to get up close today. <laughs> uh, I think I know most of you. For those who don't know me, my name is Brooke Schmidley. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees, and I have served on the search committee looking for the next president of Randolph Community College. We want to welcome you all to this forum, and thank you for coming. Uh, the board is going to spend a lot of time with uh, Mr. Groskopf and all of our candidates, uh, but this is an opportunity for stakeholders in our community and members of our campus community here to get to know our candidates a little bit and to ask any questions that you have. Uh, so I already have a few questions that have been posted up. We have a couple of options for you all. Um, please feel free to raise your hand, and this is informal, by the way. Mr. Gowdy is demonstrating raising your hands. <laughs> Holding the mic. Holding the mic. If you have a question that you'd like to ask in this session, Mr. Gowdy will bring you um, a, a microphone and you can ask your question. If you are less comfortable doing that in an open session, then please feel free to write your question down. We have note cards on the end of each of the rows. And if you'll hold the note card up, then we have um, a couple of our trustees that will come by and get those and bring those up and I'll be glad to ask the question. Uh, but we really hope that this will be a conversation between uh, you and um, our candidates so that you can get to know them a little bit. You'll also see uh, cards on the table for feedback. If you have feedback that you'd like the board to know after listening to this session, then we hope that you'll scan that code or log on and give us that feedback. So as we get started, I'd like to just tell you a little bit. Uh, we have and are, are very happy to welcome John Groskopf. Did I pronounce that correctly? Good enough. Good enough, okay. Um, he holds a master's degree in English from Florida State University and is about to finish his doctorate in education leadership with a higher education specialization 
from Aspen University later this year. He began his career as a teaching assistant at Florida State University and became an instructor at North Florida College. He later served as the director and dean of teaching and learning and vice president of academic affairs at North Florida College and is currently the president of North Florida College in Madison, Florida. Welcome. Thank you so much. So are there any, well let me start with you. Do you have anything that you would like to lead off with or, or tell more about yourself than what I've? Certainly I want to thank you very much for the invite. I'm honored that you, and this is working? You can all hear me okay? Okay, thank you very much for my honor that you uh, invited me to come see you. My wife and I came in and we got to check out the town yesterday. You have a beautiful community and I got a fantastic tour. And this is an opportunity for you to get to know me. I am interested in becoming a member of the community. So please be enthusiastic. Feel free to ask your questions. And do I have to stand up here? You can stand up. Okay, so if you have a question, I would like to get closer to you because this is people talking to people. Um, you know, if, like you said, if you're not comfortable, use the cards and it'll be anonymous. So. Okay, any questions? We have a question for Commissioner Hope I'll Haywood. start it off. So what is it that appeals to you about, um, about RCC and uh, about our community? What is it that you see? Okay. I am not a career jumper. I've been at the same institution for 23 years now. I am at a phase in my life where my wife and I have five children and four of them are gone. Well, one of them was supposed to be gone, but boomeranged, so he's <laughs> hovering. But, um, so our youngest is 17, so we're at that place where we have the opportunity, and the fear, but the opportunity to kind of think, okay, what is next in our life? And community involvement is very, very important to my family. Um, one of the things that, that I, I like to make clear in conversations is, a college president is not what I am, it's what I do, it's my job. So I am not scanning the Chronicle of Higher Education looking for jobs. I am looking for opportunities to become, my wife and I, to become members of a new community. And because I'm kind of a pain and I like living only in a certain way, I don't like heavily populated metropolitan areas, um, I'm kind of afraid of, of high drifts of snow. So it sort of limits my <laughs> geographic area and I have zero interest in working at a university because the community college mission is what I am passionate about. It's what allowed me to go from being a first generation student. I was the first one in my family to finish high school, let alone go to college. Um, the community college mission is what I've dedicated my career to. So it was actually, and, and I hope I don't make myself a weaker candidate by saying this, but it was not I did not look at the job opportunity here as a standalone. The job had to offer what I was looking for and it had to exist in a community where my wife and I felt that we could be part of, contribute to, and, and become something larger for ourselves. So of course, you know, you look at the amenities, you look at, you know, as you start getting older, you look at the, the healthcare, um, you look at growth opportunities. I'm sad to say that where I currently live I love my children. Where I currently live, the best advice I can give them is after you get your degree from my institution, go away because there's nothing here. Um, that narrative is not the same here. You're positioned, actually you're doing really well right now. You're positioned for extraordinary growth. So this is the place where you can tell your kids, we got everything you need here to build a life. And I'm eager to see if you think that I'm worthy of being part of that. Um, I don't have any grandkids yet, but if you invite me to come back, this would be a great place to tell my kids when they've really blessed me with grandchildren, come on back because here we can be close as a family, but no matter what your career needs are, your educational needs, there's something for you here. As opposed to, like I said, where I live now, it's a very different story. All right, thank you. And let me remind you all, we are live streaming this. And so if you have <coughs> questions, raise your hand up and let's give Mr. Gowdy a chance to give you a microphone so that the people <laughs> watching from home can, can hear your questions as well. Any other questions right now? Burning questions from the audience? Okay, we have one from Commissioner Fry. Good morning again, John. Hi, sir. 
Thank you. We give you an official welcome to Randolph County. Thank you, sir. Uh, jobs are a, a big part of our growth and our uh, needs right now. Uh, we probably have about 3,000 jobs. We're going to approve this afternoon incentives for another 175. Um, of course, a little over 2,000 of those are at the Toyota mega site. The Toyota mega site and jobs also requires cooperation among the community college system in our area, in particular uh, Guilford Tech and Alamance. So, you have any comments or or uh, directives or, or experience in working across with other community colleges, all of the properties in our county, and uh, I know there will be a jobs from other distances. So, any comments you'd have about the job market in particular, but also working with other institutions to get the training and fill these jobs? Certainly. The job market where I currently live is not nearly as vigorous as what you have going on here, so I'm excited that there's so much opportunity going on. But in Florida, and I apologize, I don't know if this is national or state, but in Florida we have a designation called RASIC, Rural Areas of Economic Concern. And you get special funding for small business development, for, um, for local chambers to sort of designate spaces that are prime for development, for marketing to try and lure in new businesses. And unlike North Carolina, there are 28 colleges in Florida, and we are not one college, one county. The institution I'm at now serves six counties. And all six of my counties are rural areas of economic concern. So because we're under-resourced and underpopulated, a lot of those efforts can't be done by those small rural counties. So they have to be done in cooperation with larger, typically urban institutions, who in most cases in my state, already have the largest pre-existing, pre-established training programs. So in order for colleges and rural areas in my state to really survive and thrive and meet those needs, you have to partner with those schools, especially when it comes to issues like grant writing, where you may not have en enough of a population to, to attract the attention of a corporate or government grant. So what you do is you will form consortia with other colleges in other places in the state um, decide on distribution of, of resources, decide on distribution of responsibilities. So we're used to having to work with partners in order to achieve a common goal all the time. Did that answer everything? Did I leave anything out? Okay. All right, I want to use one of the... To remember to turn my mic on. Uh, I want to offer one of the questions now we've received from the audience. I'm sure you've heard about how important the campus culture is at RCC. It's not only important to students, faculty, and staff, but to the community as well. Everything they do is aligned with that culture. Bringing in a new president is a significant change. How will you ensure the campus and organizational culture are preserved throughout the transition? Thank you. That's a great question. Um, there's a term that you use here, radical hospitality. The institution I'm at now doesn't use that term, but absolutely embraces that philosophy. Um, would it be Going too long to answer the question, if I give a background on my understanding of radical hospitality, would that be okay? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, radical hospitality is nothing new. Um, in my understanding of the concept, the way we interpret it is going all the way back to, say, 5th century with the rule of St. Benedict for Benedictine monasteries, is these are people who live in isolation, right? Um, Benedict wrote the first rule for monasteries. We've always had monastics, but... Part of that rule is an obligation for hospitality, that wayfarers, strangers, you open your door, your hearth, and your home to those. So that kind of hospitality, I think, is historic. Where you see it being played now, and you've got, um, I know there's workshops where if you happen to be a pastor of a small church, for example, you can go to workshops on radical hospitality to increase your congregation. If you're a business owner, you can go to corporate trainings and talk about this idea of radical hospitality. And of course, it's branded and it sounds new. It's not really new. Radical hospitality means the commitment to realizing that you are part of a larger something, that your community is a large living organization, and you are a component in that larger organism. So saying, going out in the community and saying, hey, you know what, if you're interested in getting better in your life, getting an education, getting a work certification, Come to Randolph, thanks. That's marketing, that's not radical hospitality. 
saying, hey, our doors are open for you. That's inviting. That's not radical hospitality. Mm -hmm. Radical hospitality means saying, not only are we here for you, we need you, and we need you to be part of determining what we're going to be one, five, 10, and 20 years from now. Because it's in your name, RCC, Randolph Community College. You can't escape that that's in your DNA, community. You can't exist without your community. And that's the purpose of community colleges. So one of the things in your organizational chart that I saw that I'm very happy with, very happy, is human resources is directly attached to the president's office. In my institution, it didn't used to be, but I moved it there. And one of the reasons why is because the president's office, I believe, is responsible for making sure that the institutional culture that is created, maintained, and grown by the community is protected from threats, that it's sustainable, that it's, I'm going to use an old-fashioned word, so pardon me, but that it is wholesome and inclusive. And those are important. And the president's job is to do that. And one of the things that employees, I'm sorry, I'm about to use a term you haven't heard me say before, Heather. Um, in my institution, what we used to call human resources, years ago, I changed the name of the office to employee services because it's parallel efforts. You've got on this side student services whose role is to do what? To make sure that students have everything they need to be successful. The parallel effort is you have to do everything you can to make your employees successful. That doesn't just mean benefits. That doesn't mean, that means giving them value added learning opportunities. How do you prepare for retirement? How do you improve your credit score? You know, bringing in experts to help your employees grow not just the professional development in case they want to grow in tracks at the institution, but how do they grow in their skill sets, in their confidence, in their understanding. When somebody new moves into the community and you hire somebody who's not from Randolph County, that's a hard thing to say, okay, come in here, you don't know anybody, you don't know the place, we're gonna give you a job, we're gonna train you, but there's this lag between what you know and what they know. So using employee services to help plug them in with mentors on campus, to help their family get to know other people. That's important. And I think from my own leadership perspective, the most important tool you have in maintaining this sense of hospitality is the people who work on your campus. I'm gonna give you a brief story, it's not gonna to take too long. Years ago, many years ago now, we had a lady come on campus, um, middle-aged woman, two or three kids, but her husband had just left her. She had no education. She came to the parking lot and she walked in and she asked a group of employees who were talking and she said, where do I go to enroll? I'm interested in coming back. And they pointed to a building and said, okay, that's where enrollment services. They went back to the conversation. Between meeting those employees and getting to enrollment services, her nerve broke. She said, you know, I can't do this. And she went back. It took her four years to come back and try again. By that point, the person she met had said, you look for me, here, let me walk you over there. So what radical hospitality means on a college campus, it means that every visitor is a VIP. That means if somebody comes on campus and says, where is the student center? You say, let me take you, let me show you. If you cannot, for some critical reason, you walk to a colleague and say, hey, can you take this lady or this gentleman to the student center? It means that you are Randolph Community College. In that moment, you are the most important person in that moment to take care of that student's need. Now, part of the culture too is, part of my own leadership team now is, it doesn't matter if you have a critical meeting with the president. If you are with a student, that's always an excuse for being late for anything because that's your job, is to reach out to those folks in the community, show them what they need, and it's especially clear, I'm glad that we invited a lot of community members to these sessions throughout the day because part of radical hospitality is realizing that there should not be a, remember the old term town and gown, usually applies to, to, to universities, there should not be a boundary between campus life and community life. Every year you have to erode that boundary because we are part of the community and in reverse, that community is part of us. So radical hospitality means realizing that you are not this thing by yourself. And shaping the future of the institution, shaping the growth, shaping program inventory, shaping practices, improving quality, 
We can sit around in think tanks all day long and form echo chambers and tell each other how great we are, but where the real growth comes from is from listening to the rest of the community that depends on us and supports us. It's, so radical hospitality is this continual reciprocal relationship that does not stop. It's not a line. It's a circle that keeps feeding on itself. Does that answer the question? Yes? Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from the audience right now? Okay. My question is kind of twofold. Okay. How much are you involved in the budget process at your current university? <coughs> And do you feel that the financial decisions are a team effort, like with your leadership team, or do you rely on a select few for decision making for the college? Our college is very small. Our budget process is very inclusive. We start months before the budget has to be presented to the board. And we start with budget workshops where budget managers are given documents which explain your current fiscal status, what your expenses have been to year to date, what your revenue is, how much money you've got left. Then they use that data, and my Office of Institutional Research is available to them. So they then project, what do I need for next year? If there's expansive growth plans, if we're going to add in, for example, a new nursing cohort or something that's going to be, they factor it all in. Then that works its way through the chair and director level. Then the management team and senior leadership meetings need to be very safe places where we are friends deciding how to best utilize the resources that we've been named stewards of. It's not a, well, I need to get this. This is mine, and I can't offer any for you. So we don't have decision-making based in silos. It's the entire senior management team that makes decisions on the final budget numbers that we present to the board. We have a separate budget workshop that is not a decision-making workshop where the board then can ask the deep questions. We can explain them the decisions we're making. So it's very collaborative. Now, the only deviation to that, and I'm going to give you the example, is when it gets really bad. In, for example, 2008, how many of you remember the horrible 2008 recession? OK, so at my institution, mid-year, mid-year, the state let us know that they were going to do a clawback of, I think it was 12% of our funding. We had to let good people go. Not that there's anything wrong with those folks, it's just there was no money to pay them. So in that situation, again, the whole collaborative process turning where do we cut, who has to let go. The senior management team made the final recommendations to me. Because the president has, I think, the ethical responsibility for managing those resources, once those recommendations were made, then I assumed all the moral responsibility and let them know, thank you for your recommendations, it's mine now. And I personally met with each of those impact individuals one-on-one -on -one and let them know that their positions wouldn't be available after such and such a date. So it's always collaborative because I am not nearly smart enough to be able to make decisions for myself and thinking what is the best way to be a steward of those. I mean, that's why you have teams. That's why you have community. Um, I think it would be very dangerous to just let one person be in charge of, of that much resources because if you mess up, if you, you can impact the trajectory of your institution, your community for years to come. So it's always very collaborative. And everybody has a voice in that process because if you teach auto body, it should matter to you how much is being spent in humanities. That's because you're all in this together as a community. All right, thank you for that. We have a question that was submitted from a faculty member. What are some strategies, methods that you would utilize to increase college enrollment of the traditional student 18 and above? 18 and above, okay. So your traditional definition here is just any adults? You don't cut off the traditional at a certain age? Because in Florida, we consider traditional like 18 to 24. So the question is anybody in adults? 18 and above. Okay. Um, back to the budgeting question and the radical hospitality question, it all comes back to the same issue of knowing who you're serving. If you see that the trajectory of your traditional students is declining, it's imperative that we figure out why is it declining. Because we are now moving into, and this is nothing new, COVID I think just accelerated the change, 
But the new normal, I, I don't really agree with that term because it implies that there's something post-COVID that had inherent and impermeable valuable that we have to try and rebuild. What we're doing as community colleges is we're having to readjust to a new market. You've got so many forces coming in. You've got across the nation, you've got folks valuing, um, deciding the value of a back and work <coughs> degree is not as certain as it was a generation ago. The American dream does not necessarily hinge on you getting a four-year university degree. You've got now employers who are making changes where they're not requiring the same level of academic degree that they used to. I believe just recently the governor here in North Carolina, didn't he remove the baccalaureate mandate from a number of state jobs? Where historically you've had to have that, that's changing. So our job is to take people from where they are to success, whatever they define as success, not what we define as success. So if in our demographic analysis we're finding the traditional adult student who typically came here and got an associate's degree, that that population is declining, we've got to figure out, is that what people want? And how do we provide it to them? Because ultimately, I'm going to tie it in something from your, uh, your, your QEP now. Your QEP, that C, do you pronounce it C2 or C squared? How do you do here on campus? C squared, OK. <laughs> From what I read, and I can only access the executive summary, I'm sorry, I, I could not access the whole report, but you are building confidence in careers and expanding the career center, brilliant. Making sure the students report on their confidence level in their career choices, brilliant. But if our goal is to get people from where they are to success, that inevitably is going to evolve, unless you're independently wealthy and just want hobbies, it's going to involve them turning their time here into a career that pays something. So I would like to see how that C squared is working its way into all the academic curriculum. So as a former English instructor, I would definitely want to have assignments in my courses where students are, of course they're writing about short stories and analyzing senses and learning MLA because that's critical to my field. But the percentage of students that are going to come out like me as an English major is very tiny. So there's no reason why you can't argue a, you know, teach a persuasive essay, but have it be on something having to do with an economic topic. There's no reason why you can't teach comparison and contrast in the terms of exploring potential career choices. So it means integrating what students want into everything that we do and figuring out to make it relevant. Because I've got to tell you, if you are a, a as, as someone who grew up in a poor family, if you don't have the resources you need, you're not sure how you can pay the electric bill, and I come to you and I say, listen, Mr. Miss 19-year-old, come to us. You can get a two-year here degree here and transfer it to a North Carolina university, and the sky is limitless. If I can't pay the electric bill, what I'm hearing is, remember Charlie Brown, the adult Charlie Brown, blah, 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 blah. Where you are doing excellent work is from your iPads report. I can see how much you have beating out your iPads cohort in less than a year certificates. You're doing a phenomenal job in doing that. Now, where we need to make sure students don't misunderstand is that that doesn't have to be the end. That takes care of your immediate need. So now you can pay the light bill. Now you can maybe set aside enough money to put, you know, start a little savings account. But there's more for you here after that. And that's where I think you, you get the, the students who are coming right out of high school on that trajectory. But we also need to make sure that there are a lot of thoroughfares from, like I call them, my son, the boomerang students who went and come back and let them know that, you know, if you missed your 18th birthday, you didn't start here, you didn't miss a window. You can come back at 19, you can come back at 20, and here are all the reasons why this would be good for you and your family. That answer the question? Absolutely. Any questions from the audience? I have more that have been submitted, so. <laughs> have at it. I'm just trying to give you a shot to get a word in. This is a question that was submitted by our Diversity and Inclusion Committee. Can you share a specific example of how you have created or contributed to a work environment where differences are valued, encouraged, and supported? Oh, absolutely. Um, when I became president of my institution, we had a thing that was called Administrative Council. And everybody from a certain tier and above would come. And the theory was that important college decisions would be discussed there, and those folks would go back, and they would disseminate, and they would gather information. Well, you can imagine how well that works. 
Remember the telephone game where the story changes along the way? So I evolved that into a component that we now call open council. And what's the difference between administrative council and open council? Yeah. Open council is everyone is invited to come. We do it once a month on the week before the board meetings. And we do it in an auditorium we have on campus. And not everybody can come because some departments, you know, somebody's got to be there, but they usually take turns. And at those meetings, we go over what's on the board agenda. We talk about state issues that are of relevance. For example, in Florida, concealed carry on campus, not campus, that's a hot issue this particular year. So everybody has a chance to give feedback in a forum <coughs> like this. And I promise everybody that if you ask me a question, you're giving one of two answers. You can get the truth, or you're going to get, I can't talk about it right now. And the second answer is like if you have an employee who has been terminated. Well, frankly, there are legal issues why I can't discuss it. And secondly, because culturally, I'm going to protect that person's privacy and not tell you their dirty secrets. So that gives a chance. In those meetings is where we have some of those issues come up, where you may have an employee say, you know, I've been here six years. I've been here eight years. I've never been asked if I want to learn something new. I've never been given the opportunity for professional development. So then my first discussion is with the supervisor. Well, why, why are you hiding this? from me and then because we have like you we have an open door policy where you know everyone can talk to anyone is we try and address those shortfalls with different employees experiences and interactions with the colleges and institution as a family um, because sometimes based on for example I'll give you another personal example gosh I'm talking a lot about myself I'm so sorry um, <coughs> as a first generation college student I'm also probably, I can't tell you with certainly because my father was absent in my life, but I'm probably a first generation American as well, is I grew up raised by Cuban grandparents and we were very, very poor. So I had no idea as a student or as an employee how to advocate for myself. Because culturally, my grandfather who worked physical jobs always taught me, earn every penny that you, that you, you know, earn every penny they pay you. Don't take money you haven't earned and be grateful. So I go through life with a sense of gratitude but also means that I never learned how to advocate for myself. That was cultural. And you will have employees on campus who feel trapped. They feel unappreciated. They may feel that they have no window of movement in any direction. But because of their cultural context, like mine, they don't know how to share that. So you need to be proactive with things like open counsel, with an open door attitude, with encouraging communications teams. For example, one of the best things that you do is when you have committees and work teams on campus, don't let people volunteer for those. Because you will find the same folks on the same projects all the time. Make people interact with folks that they don't interact with on a daily basis on campus. Make them understand each other's experience. Another thing that works great is have different departments on campus do open houses. Have the cosmopology department say, hey, from this date, we're inviting everybody on campus. Come see what we do. Meet our students. Meet our people. Here are our troubles. Here are our successes. Because you probably have people who work 100 yards away who have no idea what goes on in that space. So you break down those barriers. Just like you need to break down the barriers between the institution and the community, you absolutely need to break down the barriers. Now, that's, I think, one of the issues that is causing so much chaos nationally with universities is the silo mentality. Because universities, first of all, they want to just be walled in, right? The ivory cities, so it's, just, it's just about us. But then within universities, you have horrible tug of wars for talent, for resources, for new job postings, right? It's, well, if you get a faculty member this year, that means I can't get a faculty member this year, so I'm gonna try and make my department look better than yours. That's the DNA of universities. That cannot be in the organism of community colleges because if we can't be a community among ourselves, there's no way we're going to be able to serve our responsibility to the larger community. Did I answer the question, ma'am? OK. All right, from the audience, any questions? We have a question from Reynolds Lisk, one of our trustees. Yeah, I noticed when we were doing our research that North Florida College was named multiple times one of the best colleges in the nation. Seven times. 
seven times. Yes, sir. Could you tell me a little bit or tell us about that and how you got <clears throat> to that status? What did you do? Certainly. What I did was exactly what I just told you I did. Ex exactly that and no more. I certainly cannot take credit for that. The, um, this is a survey put out by the Chronicle of Higher Education, and it does two things. It sends out random surveys among your employees, um, faculty, staff, administrators, adjuncts, and it surveys students. And they take that data, and they also consider, and I don't know the weighting, you know, it's their secret formula, like the KFC formula. It's their secret, but they also take in your outputs, your institution outputs, and they come up with this designation. And the reason that we are successful is exactly the things I've told you, is um, it's not a dedicated effort, because if all we did was try and win this award, then that means that you look at the variables that determine this award, and that's what you focus on, and you ignore what does not contribute to the award. And that's not an ethical way of leading an institution. So we do what we do, and it makes everyone feel valued, and that's what the Chronicle Award recognizes. Um, so it's, um, it's not a hard thing to do. Um, work with your family the way you should, and the Chronicle will acknowledge it. Now, like I said, I don't, I think that those things are possible only in community colleges because our culture is a very different thing from university culture. So um, I don't know how universities do what they do. I know that I certainly, um, universities are very important parts of the American landscape. They build knowledge, um, they create technological innovation which contributes to our betterment in society. But in terms of my life arc, I don't see myself functioning well in, in a university setting. Is that okay? Look, I have a question back here. Okay. What's your process for making decisions? You put all the possible choices in a hat. <laughs> um, it depends on the decision. That's a, um, there are some decisions like budgeting, like program inventory, mm -hmm. like um, community outreach that needs to be as broad-based as possible. Um, in that case, you make it broad-based. Now, one of the things I don't like is I don't like unnecessary layers of bureaucracy. So, if you want to have a meeting with the president, you don't need to set a meeting with your director to get permission to meet with the dean, to get permission to talk to a VP, to then get scheduled on the president's calendar. You come and you tell me your idea. So part of decision making also in certain, is spontaneity. If you are a nursing instructor and you say, you know, they have this, and I'm going to point this table because it's just on the line. They have a simulator that's built like this table. It's a giant iPad. And it's used to teach anatomy and physiology. Have you ever seen this? It's amazing technology. It looks like a big iPad, and it's a body. And you can strip away the skin. You can strip away the muscles. You can see the circuit. So, a recent decision was you've got a nurse who comes and says, listen, I just saw this at a conference. This is awesome. I want one of these. And you're like, well, okay. So then what you do is you brought it, you talk to your nursing leadership, you talk to your finance office, and you figure out, okay, how can we afford this? You talk to your teaching and learning department and figure out what kind of professional training is going to be required. You talk to IT and figure out how we're going to make sure this thing keeps running because you know you buy it and oh it's great now you got to pay every year to keep upgrading software and things like that. So I don't want to deflect your question. Making decision, I think it it, it depends on the context of the decision. Um, in some cases, if you have a faculty member who comes in and says, "Hey, my colleague, I got to take part. My colleague just did this. This is going to instigate a Title IX violation, and we're going to have to." In that case, you don't do broad-based decision making. You have a very definite marching orders for what you have to do in that situation. You take care of that <clears throat> quickly and quietly, minimize any additional damage to your people or your institution, and make whatever has to happen happen. So I'm sorry that's not a, that's not a specific answer for your question. I apologize. Okay, other questions from the audience? One from our board chair. Yes. What's your position on sports in the community colleges? Our institution, where I'm at now, we had sports until 2007, right before the uh, 
the Great Recession, it was not a positive thing for our institution in the sense that it was tremendously expensive. The proportion of our revenues that were expensed out to maintain sports programs were really unsustainable. There was not a lot of community financial support. So it was costing, and um, I can't give you an exact number, but it was something like it cost us three and a half times as much for every athlete completer as it did for a non-athlete. So you were redirecting resources and you were not able to serve your core mission because of athletics. So our institution, under the prior president, our institution stopped athletics in 2007. In Florida, a lot of the colleges now are actually jettisoning or downsizing their athletic programs because the state funding formula really doesn't incentivize you doing that. There are some colleges out the Panhandle, for example, though, that have incredibly successful booster clubs. There's one college that has a second foundation which is just for its athletic program, they're so successful, they actually not just pay for the athletics, they write a surplus check back to their institution every year. I think those examples are not as common. I think that's an extraordinary situation. But I think you know anything to involve students to interact with the community, and you know sports can be a good entertainment venue for the community to come do something. It gets folks on campus, which is important. If you're going to do it, you've got to make sure that it, do it doesn't disrupt your core mission of providing you know, academic degrees and workforce certifications. Um, if you can manage to do it and you want to do it, if you can't afford sports, there are still a lot of other opportunities for student engagement. You've got eSports, which is very inexpensive. Mm -hmm. You've got, for example, we've had a great success with community drama clubs where students who want to do drama, but not enough of them to have a drama program, you put it under a community theater umbrella, and the community comes out and they do set design, they do costumes, they, they do lighting, and students and community members who want to perform get a chance to perform. But it's not a burdensome expense just on the educational institution. It's sort of shared among all the, the stakeholders who are interested in having it. All right, I have a question. While you all are thinking, we're getting down to the last 15 minutes or so, but I do have a question from a faculty member. What are some strategies or methods that you would utilize to increase on-campus course offerings and bring students back to campus so they can utilize our facilities, services, resources, and engage in student life activities? That's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, any faculty in the room? Just raise your hand for Okay, it looked from your iPads report that like 71% of your students were fully online. Is that accurate? Okay, so long term, that's dangerous. That's dangerous because it has repercussions for your on-campus services. It has implications for your space utilization. You've got all these academic classrooms. If they're empty most of the day, it's hard to justify asking for money for facilities when you have facilities that are underused or not used. And another reason why it's dangerous long-term is because right now, I think, many folks who want the community college experience still look local. But remember, we're getting an internet consumer mindset among particularly younger students who are used to going to Amazon and buying one product and not caring where it comes from. That could easily become the model for higher education, where a student logs on and says, hey, I'm interested in this course, and they don't care where it comes from, right? Because there's no institutional loyalty when you just want an online course. So, I think it's figuring out a reason to get them back on campus. Um, I could not find this in any documentation I had access to, but have any of you tried high flex courses on this campus? We have where students have the option of coming. I think that if you try and build as much of a value added to those on campus experiences, yeah, you can get the bare bones online, but if you come to class during that time session, hey, your chair is there, come fill it. And you will also get this and this. You know, you don't want to bribe students and say, well, you get 20 extra points if you come to class. Mm -hmm. But make sure the experience is energizing, that it's worthy. Because um, I think now the mindset is, you know, I can log on or I can put on shoes and spend $8 in gas. And you've got to make it worth it. And I don't want to limit that to just students because a lot of talent that could be employed at the institution can find good paying jobs in the ether. 
So it's a matter of making sure that the experiences on campus, the quality of life issue that you can provide for your employees, your visitors, and primarily for your students, make it worth taking that little extra commitment. Um, I also think teasers are really good. I think if you have, for example, a really great history professor, have that history professor record a 20-minute podcast on the cause of you know, the Spanish-American War. <clears throat> Very dramatic thing. And say, hey, want to learn more? Here's the class time. You know, and get them to come and want to be part of mm -hmm. that. I think that the future of higher education, especially with micro-credentialing and all those other things happening, is I very much see the future of those traditional courses being very hybridized, not just in the delivery modality, online, face-to-face, -face, but also in who's in there. So I think where you used to have a group of 25 freshmen, and I, I keep going back to English, I'm sorry, that's my background, but you have a freshman comp. You may have 25 students in there. Well, it may be that in five years, six of those students are AA students. Three of them are workforce students who are developing writing skills. Three of them are community members who want to just improve their writing skills. I think that's probably in the future of our industry. Okay, questions from the audience. You came all this way to talk. Talk. <laughs> During your tenure, it looks like your institution went through a name change. Mm -hmm. What do you see as part of your vision or opportunities for Randolph Community College? In Florida, um, starting in I think it was maybe 10, the legislature authorized Florida to begin offering baccalaureate degrees in the community college system. To do what? The, the traditional community college system in Florida was authorized by the legislature to begin offering workforce oriented baccalaureate degrees. It started with a test case at one institution and then it grew. So in Florida there was no requirement for a name change. But the post-secondary culture of the state began developing that if you're going to offer a baccalaureate degree that you need to move out of the community college model. Even though nothing else changed, you still have your same statutory districts um, defined in statute. Your mission is still the same. <clears throat> and baccalaureates are only offered in a very limited case basis, which is they have to be in response to a local workforce need. So the vision I would have for Randolph would be to make sure that we are well positioned ahead of time to take advantage of all the growth opportunities that are going to be happening in the county. To make sure that you have very frequent and authentic communication with the change leaders in the industries that the institution is seeking to, to support. If somebody comes to you and says, hey, I'm going to need, and I apologize, I know you have this already, but if, if a hospital comes and says, we're building a new wing, we're going to need 15 new radiologists next year. With the bureaucracy of getting SACS COC approval for that, we're trying to get equipment, we're trying to hire, we're trying to train, we're trying to recruit, you're looking at what, 36, 48 months out? But if you're able to have these change leaders in the industries you're interested in come to you and you work with them every week you're there, and they're telling, well, you know what? We're looking at maybe in five years doing X. You go back to campus and you start your planning for X right now. And it may not show up in any budget documents. It may not show up in any board meetings. But you are doing the legwork so that you are right there ready to pull the lever as soon as they make a decision on their end. So it's being receptive and reciprocal. Also, one of the things is, in terms of the state of North Carolina performance metrics, there's seven of them, is deciding which of those metrics, we have to do well at all seven of those metrics, but which of those individual metrics are going to be the standout metrics that speak not just to the students and potential students, but to the employers that are going to depend on that talent base. And I think, like I said, I think your QEP is right on the money. I don't know how deep the QEP goes because I was only able to access the executive summary. Um, but you know that QEP needs to have its fingers, that C squared needs to have its fingers throughout the entire curriculum. Any questions? All right, we have time probably for one question. James, we've got one over here. Okay. I could probably be loud enough. This is off of the 
the live stream. This is not my question. Okay. I thought I'd just throw it out there. Uh, uh, question, what is your vision regarding diversity and inclusion in our growing multicultural community in Randolph County? Community is in your name, right? Which means community has to be in your mission. Community has to be in your operations. Community has to be in your heart. And we don't get to sit in a small room and decide what the term community means. Community means what the people who live in that community define it. So it just means maintaining that concept, that historical concept of radical hospitality, which means everyone has a place in your home, at your hearth, and in your heart. Was that enough of an answer? I think so. Okay. Okay, that one was fast, so we can do one more. <laughs> Be careful if you scratch, I'm going to call on you. Yes, we have a question from Bob Morrison, one of our trustees. Hang on just a minute, Bob. Wait for the mic. Wait for the mic. Okay. In response to a previous question, you talked about being prepared to take advantage of the opportunities that are there for the college and for the community. What do you do to make sure that you're bringing the entire community and leadership along with you on that journey? You have to be collaborative and open in every phase, in your planning, in your dreaming. I mean, college administrators do a lot of dreaming. You know, any administrators in the room, raise your hand. Okay, you know how sometimes it's Sunday, and you're taking a shower, and the hot water's got your blood flowing, and the most brilliant idea for how you're going to change your department hits you like a lightning bolt. Those are important. Don't invite people in the shower with you. <laughs> but you have to start talking about those ideas. You have to create an environment where those ideas are valued, even as flash in the pans. I think a mistake is to expect too much preparation before you start exploring an idea. So to come and you say, Here's an idea for how we're going to expand our nursing cohort. Here is the fiscal analysis. Here is the, the community needs analysis. Here is my five and ten year projections. That's important work. That comes later. The first work is you need to, that's a great idea. You need to talk to five or six people about flushing out that idea. Get feedback from your peers. Talk to our community partners. Talk to the facilities that hire and provide clinical opportunities for our nurses and let that idea start becoming a cohesive mass that other people want to buy into, want to be part of, even before it becomes a plan. So now when you actually start working up the plan, you're not looking around for stakeholders to give you information. You're not looking around for stakeholders to give you um, a commitment of support, um, encouragement. You're not looking for where, where are we going to get the data from. You've already got people who have who have been made aware that this thing is there. It may not go anywhere. If it doesn't go anywhere, the best you've done is you've built additional relationships. So there's no, there's no downside to that. But you have to be open to those conversations. And this institution is larger than my current institution. But you are not so large that all of you don't have an opportunity to talk to each other as frequently as you want to. Even the antisocial folks who keep their office door all the time and dim the lights and pretend they're not there. Those folks are all part of the decision-making process. I think a huge mistake for any leader that you choose, not just the president's office, but any office, is to think that they are best positioned to make all the decisions for everybody around them. That's, that's not how these institutions are designed to function. Can I have one more? Absolutely. <laughs> Chairman Fry? <laughs> Did you have an early college down there, and what was your collaboration with your local public school system? Okay. Um, in Florida, we use, we use the term dual enrollment. It's, it's the same exact thing. We use the term dual enrollment. And I think this fall, 31% of our overall FTE was dual enrolled students. It is incredibly important. In Florida, families don't pay it all for dual enrollment. The college bills the district a reduced rate, and the college gets a little line item to pay for part of the educational materials. So having um, cost is never a barrier to students who want to take advantage of early college. So I serve six counties. So those six 
rural counties, not just public schools, private schools and charter schools, all take advantage. And there are, we have an Office of Dual Enrollment that we created recently, and it's very vigorous discussions. Every year we have a summit with the early, to use your terminology here, early college advisors from all the institutions we serve, and they help us craft the articulation agreements for the following year. They help tell us what is working, what isn't working, and it is incredibly important because it gives families who probably aren't thinking about college for a number of factors, it gives the students an opportunity to experience what is life in post-secondary education like. Now where I don't think Florida has done a great job yet is on the workforce side of that. That's where this is all linked. Is workforce is sort of behind the curve and part of the reason for that is when you go from a credit hour course to a clock hour course it requires seat time it becomes more challenging where for an academic dual enrollment student they can log on to a, a, a distance education course they can log on to a real-time hybrid <coughs> course and it can be delivered to them where they are or where they really want to be when you require seat time in a lab most of the rural high schools I serve don't have facilities don't have equipment so it becomes then very delicate partnerships. For example, one of the ones we're able to do successfully because it's not equipment heavily is the EMS certification. Um, there's also, historically, we've also done some, do you guys use the term CNA up here, certified nurse yeah. to do CNA um, training in the high schools? There's also some desire to do, every one of my six counties currently has a prison in it. So corrections is a, is a, is a, is a popular career and a, and a good career. That's been a desire. The issue with that is there is a gap between when students graduate and how long they can take to take the certification exam because of an age restriction. So a lot of the knowledge is no longer current. But I think early college is fantastic. I think that it's, good. it's the future. Um, we talked about the danger of our institutions not having the same number of traditional students. I think the next domino is going to be you're going to start seeing in high schools most students are going to be reaching outwards to community colleges for academic um, accelerated academic mechanisms and career training because the idea of I went through high school I had a great time I made some great friends I'm 18 I have a high school diploma there aren't a lot of <coughs> careers that place value on the high school diploma anymore so the best way to serve those those youngsters is to make sure that when they turn 18, they've got some kind of credential of value. Whether it's a bunch of college credits that they can come then to, to the community college and finish with an AA, or whether it's a industry certification, or whether it's, hey, I've got these six credits and now I can go articulate into this career path. I think that that is the, the new population that the community colleges need to begin preparing to embrace because they're minors, which means there are different obligations and different responsibilities that colleges have that you're not used to having with your adult students. Did I answer everything, sir? Very good. Okay. All right. Kelly, how are we on time? Are we done? Two minutes. Does anybody have a two question? More questions. Two more questions, did you say, or two minutes? A couple more minutes. Okay. Does anybody have any parting shots? If you ask yes-no questions, we can get a dozen more. <laughs> I came all this way to meet you. Don't be shy. Any questions? Well, let's end it with this last question. Um, you've applied for this job. If you get the job, give us your vision of you know, the first couple of weeks and, and months. You get sure. it? What do you do with it? Sure. Okay. My very first meeting will be with the director of campus safety because I'm not familiar with your campus operations and emergencies can happen at any point and making sure that our people and our facilities are safe and healthy that's critical so that would be my very first thing is understanding your emergency protocols your continuity of operations plan those kinds of things then in addition to I'm sure all the other meetings that folks will want to have is I would like to talk to some of our longest serving employees to get their perspective of how the institution has evolved. And I would like to get the perspective at the same time of some of our newest employees to understand their experience of onboarding, of being made to feel welcome to the college, 
of how they were able to integrate themselves into the workings of Randolph Community College. And then, of course, primarily student engagement at the beginning, because if you go to my current institution's catalog, you know how you always got that letter from the president at the beginning, which is the most boring thing to write. You know, you've got to have a picture where you're trying to look, you know, academic. You know, and they take that picture, and then you got to talk about your institution, and they all sound blah 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 blah. So if you go and you look at mine, it really expresses my belief is that colleges are places where lots of questions should be asked in the students, um, in, in, the, in the peer tutoring center, in the library, in the classroom, lots of questions should be asked. The most important question at a community college And if you never invite me back, just please remember this. The most important question for community colleges is, what can we do for you? And that is, I think, why we need to talk, my first couple weeks here, we'll be talking to students is, what can we do for you? By the way, you've enrolled. Are we giving you what you need? Which is the, the, the flip end of that question. And if I ever got challenge coins made, that's what my challenge coins would have on them. Is one side is, how can we serve you? And the other side would be, are we giving you everything we need? Because that is service, and that is our obligation as a community college to the community that allows us to exist. And I know that you exist in statute, and I know SACS identifies you, but the reality of the vulnerability of community colleges that people don't want to acknowledge is we exist because the community permits us to exist by trusting us with their children, by trusting us with their future employees, <laughs> by providing us with the fiscal support we need, the community support, the word of mouth support, the legislative support of good folks going to their legislators and saying, I believe in Randolph. You need to believe in Randolph too. Throw money in that direction. So those would be the initial conversation. Um, as I looked around, I didn't see any deferred maintenance where I would go, oh, that roof has to go. It's, you guys take a lot of pride in your facilities. I see you take a lot of pride in each other. It was a wonderful tour this morning. So um, that would be that would be my, my first couple weeks. All right. Well, I think that about um, wraps up the time that we have. Again, I do want to put a plug in for the feedback uh, forms. Please scan that and use. Hang on. And use that to provide any feedback that you have to <coughs> the board. Um, that you might want us to consider as we make a decision as to who is going to be the next president of Randolph Community College. Thank you all very much for coming, and we Thank hope you. that you'll also attend the future sessions with all of our candidates.